Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for braving all the elements and everything else. Um, I have a wonderful panel, uh, and I'm joined by wonderful ladies this morning. Um, we have an empty seat. She was supposed to be here. Um, we'll see if she manages to join. Um, Vericha, Good morning. welcome. Thank you. Katie, welcome. Thanks for joining me this morning. And Paula, there she is. There you go. Uh, hi, welcome, Paula. Paula is joining us virtually from, um, from Milan. Um, I, I'm going to gro- grab the mic, the quick clicker, sorry. Because before we get into the panel, I just wanted to run you through a few thoughts and, um, and kind of comments that um, I have seen or managed to catch in the few in-person events that I have managed to see and attend over the last, uh, the last few months, um, those that did go forward in socially distanced way. Um, and then we'll get into a conversation um, for, uh, with our guest as to what this, uh, what this means for the industry. So let me really quickly, uh, quickly start. I really like this sentence. For those of you who attended um, sort of video week a few weeks back, um, Richard Kramer, who is always very entertaining, had this up at some point. It was kind of hidden in the background. And I thought it was an interesting comment. And more specifically, the comment that he made or used around um, you know, yes, CTV, you know, is the path forward. And by that, you know, of course, we all know audiences are fragmenting, moving to new uh, connected devices. So no doubt about that, right? We see it in numbers. Um, you know, clearly the share and the growth from, um, you know, the general video segment and video advertising, a lot of it is coming from, um, from CTV or the definition that we have for CTV, if not all of it. Um, we also see that from a raw growth perspective, we're now in the prime of it, right? We've just had a pandemic. Everybody stayed home. We all connected our, um, our various devices, signed up to all these, uh, these platforms. But of course, the growth is going to tailor. But between now and 2024, CTV and what's known as CTV is going to double up, right? Those are the US figures, so apologies, there's not yet uh, the same kind of report done for Europe or not that I've seen. Um, but if you look at sort of between now and 2024, there's roughly about $15 billion that is going to come incrementally to what is being spent today. So um, that's quite a, a significant number. So if you look at where it's coming from, this is really uh, particularly important here is but half of it is coming from what will be referred to throughout the day. Um, I think it's already been mentioned in the previous session, um, sort of wall gardens. And the wall gardens in, in, in the US have been defined as sort of you know, YouTube, Roku, Hulu, and other, um, other platforms. And the, 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 the remainder is you know, kind of AVOD from, from broadcasters and, and uh, digital first platforms. And I suppose that. Um, the point that Richard was making is this entire growth you know, is there. It's here to stay for sure. But it's also creating huge expectations. Let me walk you through something that I, I kind of, you know, apology, it's not as well put as the other previous graph where I put this together. Um, I didn't put names on there just because I didn't want to you know, get beat up after this, this session. But I, I did refer to whether they were broadcasters or um, either tech platform or CTV platform. Those of you who want to inquire could probably dig out who they are. But this first chart is um, the revenues that are observed today. Each circle represents a company. And these are revenues of publicly traded company. You know, the first, the, the four largest one, the five largest one on here are broadcasters, right? Traditional broadcaster at sales revenue in Europe. Um, and it's quite expensive. I think the, you know, the first one, the largest one is roughly, you know, roughly about three, four, five billion dollars, something like that. And so you see those smaller dots are, are kind of the CTV platform or CTV first companies. And the issue about expectation is, you know, we all live in a world where, you know, except for Channel 4, 
we are dependent on public markets. Um, and so at the moment, if you look at what this graph becomes, so these are the exact same companies. So let me blow this up because I quite like this animation. <laughs> you go from revenues, right? These are the revenues of the, the various broadcast companies. And then you go to the market cap in financial markets divided by revenues, right? Notice that the shift has been complete. You now have, whether it's tech companies or CTV first platform that have built these huge expectations in market in such that their market cap and what they face in front of investors have been completely blown out of proportion. Um, and the expectation for here is that um, if a broadcaster is expected to deliver $1 in revenue to $1 in market cap, a CTV or tech platform is expected to deliver 62 times their revenue from a market cap perspective. Why is this important? If you look at the raw impact of it and, um, and what this means is that CTV dollar, CTV revenue, have this huge impact on financial market and therefore have these huge expectation. And in a way, this creates an interesting dynamic in our industry. If you think about the 15 billions that I referenced before um, and this particular chart, there's almost not enough available growth dollars for everybody here to sustain the growth. The only way that this comes in is if you know, there's enough linear inventory that becomes available in a targeted fashion. And so the problem here is it, it introduces a dynamic of you know, the players that are involved in the CTV first business today are trying to accelerate this, um, this passage or this uh, move to enable linear to a targeted fashion, to make linear like CTV. Then you have you know, broadcasters and other large publishers who are basically saying, yes, hang on, I've not done that yet. Don't force me. And so a lot of the things I hear in market today is kind of this opposing pressure between buyers and sellers. One side wanting to accelerate this targeted um, aspect and the unlocking of linear. And the other saying, yes, we will get there, but don't force us because the tools that you are pushing me to use are not necessarily ready for me. So in a nutshell, let's be, let's be careful and remember that we need to create value for marketers. This is paramount. Yes, audience are shifting, but if we're not going there with the right tools, if we're not going there with the right framework, we're not going to get there in a way that makes sense for everybody, particularly for the marketers. You know, if you think about today, the size of the, the linear addressable market is quite small still. I think we'll, we'll talk about it today, but the unlocking potential is there. We all realize that if we are in a path to enable, um, you know, targeted TV and, and linear to be data enabled in the right fashion, privacy fashion, we'll create a massive amount of value for everybody but let's not kid ourselves, we're not there yet. Um, so we're now here, it's the end of 2021. We have, we've had a, you know, call it interesting 18 months where everybody has, has, has shifted uh, their spend. If we wanna bring Paola back with us, um, there you go, hi Paola. Um, I wanna talk about sort of where we go, where we go from there. We're at an inflection point, we often talk about um, how we have to not reset, but restart the way we're thinking about our entire industry. And I wanted to, to sort of start with um, the impact that this has, have on, this has had on your organizations and more specifically, this rapid acceleration. Starting with you, Virtual, because mm -hmm. you've, you know, effectively you started just before, you know, we've been in this situation. And we kind of wanted to, to get your thoughts and your perspective on how you know, you've seen your job and, and Channel 4 evolve uh, through the pandemic and as this um, shift was happening. Well, I think I suppose the first thing to say is that this world and, and this thinking around connected TV and particularly the digital transformation is not such a new thing at Channel 4. 
because of our exposure to those younger audiences, who were some of the first, obviously, to start migrating their viewing, we've been on this journey uh, for about 10 years or so, and we were the first uh, broadcaster to launch a data strategy. But then coming through the pandemic and obviously seeing some of the, the impacts of last year, plus the uh, exponential growth of the SVODs, we then launched our Future 4 strategy right at the end of 2020. And the Future 4 strategy is a very clear calling card for the entire organization. And it's a really important point. It's about shifting how we think about ourselves in terms of pivoting to digital, to prioritize digital growth ahead of linear ratings, which, you know, given that we don't have some of the constraints of some of the other uh, broadcasters, particularly in Europe, uh, in terms of shareholders, et cetera, we have a little bit more space to, to experiment and to drive harder in some of these areas. And we're taking full advantage of that. So the Future 4 strategy is absolutely dictating how we think about the world, from measurement through to how we commission. Uh, so the content that we're now producing, which platforms and devices we're optimizing that for. So adopting and learning from some of the pure play SVOD uh, techniques as well. And we're also thinking about it from, a, from an advertising perspective in terms of the products that we give and also thinking about you know, the, the platform experience and what that means for both viewers and for advertisers. So lots more work still to do, but it's a journey that we've been experimenting on and learning about, with, you know, whether it be through our advanced data products that we already have uh, available and in market, whether that be the programmatic or other pieces, right through to actually, you know, experimenting with our subscription layer, for instance, which uh, Katie and the rest of the team obviously will have much more experience of. But for us, this is a real moment of experimentation, but an absolute wholehearted drive forward into this future world. Yeah, and I think, I've, you know, we've seen it sort of this, since, since your launch. It's been quite a fascinating, you know, write-up for, for Channel 4, and, and, uh, and well done on, on that. Uh, Katie, Paul, I'll bring, I'll bring you in, uh, you know, after, uh, just after this, so, you know, stand with us. Uh, from him, but Virta was mentioning sort of the um, <clears throat> the absolute par you know paramount importance of um, thinking about our various platforms in you know this new dynamic with um, you know with the Edva as well platform. Obviously, this you know discovery uh, both in the U.S. but also here you know has a huge you know new strategy around Discovery Plus and things like that. How you know how is this you know the last eighteen months, but also you know, with your perspective specifically in the UK with, you know, the partnership that you have with yeah. your sales house, how does that put things in, in perspective and how do you move forward with that? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it? So as a kind of traditional pay company, we are later to the party, I think, on direct-to-consumer in, you know, in its entirety, but we're accelerating incredibly quickly. So we did launch Discovery Plus towards the back end of last year and to date that is a pure play SVOD product but in the US actually there's an ad supported um, version of that and that's something that we'll be looking at going forward because what's really clear is we want we need to continue to work with all of our partners and we have very close partnerships with our ad sales um, you know reps in Sky Channel 4 but we need to have much more of a direct relationship with our consumers as well and it's just really interesting now as a business to see how much everyone's working very very differently because you have that much more immediate relationship now with how people are actually watching and engaging with your content so it's a really interesting time and it's it, you know it's much more dynamic and it's moving much more quickly um so there's a lot to learn but i think um you know we all have to continue and i think it's important for people like us to offer a viewing alternative that works for advertisers because obviously you know, who knows where Netflix is going to go with ads being ad supported in the future, but we have to kind of try and make sure that we're giving advertisers an opportunity to target those kinds of viewers, definitely. Yeah, and just a quick follow-up question on that. Do you feel, you know, obviously having sort of these dual strategy and, and bringing this to, to Europe at some point, you know, is there pressure from a sort of content management perspective between sort of the AVOD side and the SVOD side and how you sort of managing that internally, you, you know, being sort of managing ad yeah. sales, is that sort of a different perspective to, uh, you know, and sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here. No, 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 uh, no, but... I'm smiling because it's like an existential question for all big broadcasters at the moment, which is you want to reach all cohorts. How do you do that? Do you have one product that tries to hit everyone? Do you have multiple products? You know, you look at the Viacom strategy and they clearly have some very different products in market. I don't think any of us know the answer to that at the moment. So I think there's going to be a lot of 
testing and learning and changing over the next few years about how you and different content works in different places we are very much seeing that you know some stuff really drives subscribers doesn't necessarily then drive long-term engagement you know then you need to keep trying to push people with other content it's just it's really interesting and and, and us having access to that data that obviously advertisers want access to as well is it's um it's it's really interesting it is really interesting thank you uh paula uh, I'm, I'm looking, I don't know what you see here, so it's really tricky for me to, uh, but I am gonna address to you as the screen. Um, or in front of me, that's easier. Um, so, you know, we've been working quite closely um, for a while now, and I know that over the last 18 months, you also had a number of product launches, um, specifically also various platforms, uh, platform launch, but interestingly, um, I always refer to Mediaset as a very particular um, example because of the strength in Italy in particular of sort of free-to-air, right? And, you know, historically free-to-air has been, uh, you know, a huge part of audience in, in Italy. Um, how are you seeing this? And, you know, has, you know, obviously we haven't caught up in, in a long time, um, you know, at least in person. And so I'm, I'm curious, like the last 18 months from an Italian market perspective, um, where, where have you seen this change? Are you observing some of the things like, you know, if you listen to some of the things that have been said here, is it something similar in, in Italy? Is, you know, I imagine, you know, people have not, um, you know, it's a similar kind of cultural shift, but I'm also curious to, to hear if there's anything specific that, that you see have happened in, in your market uh, around this digital transformation. Uh, yes, yeah, so to, to your point, I think Italy in Europe is the market with the strongest uh, you know, linear TV position, both in, in terms of investments, uh, of time spent and eyeballs, uh, and we are still in that strong position. So the lockdowns of the past years have pushed uh, audiences up uh, for, for linear TV. But at the same time, you know, we had this push towards uh, OTTs and non-linear viewing. So we saw our platforms growing massively. Um, and as you know, we, we did launch and invest in the, the addressable TV offering when at very, very early stages. So we did it not out of need of urgency, but just because our vision was that, you know, we would have had other opportunities, more opportunities thanks to connected TVs. And we really wanted to be in that space and it actually paid off because the acceleration we had uh, in the past year, year and a half, um, really, you know, helped us to have all the products in line and ready to to have this very healthy uh, growth, way above expectations. So I think uh, the, the the trick now for us is, you know, how do you blend linear TV with non-linear? So how we get in there with uh, a total video measurement and i know uh you know there, there were some talking about these and some questions in 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 the panel before this um that's very delicate so the, our local geek is moving to that direction so we're starting having ratings for our shows not yet uh, advertising campaigns but we have total video for for show, for uh, you know our programming across several devices that's going out to market now with auditel and you know we're pursuing this way uh, because, you know, th there's a lot of value also in the linear viewing. And, you know, from a commercial standpoint, you have two opportunities. You can sell linear and non-linear together thanks to total TV ratings, or you can sell non-linear TV or at least addressable TV on both linear and non-linear um, per se, thanks to, you know, addressability data uh, with all, you know, more digital kind of flavor. Uh, so it's a double opportunity for us to go to market with the same uh, evolution of our product. And um, thanks for this. I, I think it's it's super important. Obviously, we don't have, I mean, I don't know, I can't see the room, so I can't see uh, everybody, but uh, I would assume that we don't have a lot of people that have travel from far, so kudos to those who have. Um, but um, follow-up question, one of the things that we hear a lot about you know, the, the, the explosion of online viewing and, and, and CTV growth is um, sort of either new advertisers that are coming on, and I'll ask, you know, the, the panel that in a second, but I did want to ask, ask you because I know that historically you and your team have been very active in sort of launching new products specifically um, and wanted to see if there was things that, if there were products that you felt, you know, specifically around linear, around the growth of, 
um, of CTV that you were either thinking about launching or had launched in the last year that you felt had a real impact uh, in market? And you know, I think it'd be useful for this audience, you know, some of the products around HBB TV specifically, which is not that um, you know, not that wide here, uh, but thinking about Italy as probably the leading market with Germany and Europe that has this kind of, um, you know, HBB TV like strength. So I wanted to just see if you could tell a few words on this. Uh, yes, we, we, we focus on three things. One is data, because, you know, with everything that's happening, we're moving everything into a first party data infrastructure. And we're looking at ways uh, of having uh, advertiser integrate with our own data so they can plan on their own data with us on our HBB TV channel and CTV. Uh, as something you know similar to what Channel 4 has done uh, recently as well. Um, and then we are focusing on blending linear and non-linear. So we are... We can hear you. Okay, yeah. so, uh, sorry, I froze. Um, so we can, uh, we've uh, implemented technology uh, thanks to Free Will that's helping us to um, blend on linear breaks addressable and linear uh, spots so that you know we can manage clashes among advertisers or uh, you know categories and industries and that's because the user experience on linear tv is very very high quality uh, and so you want to preserve that even you know with with making the most out of it thanks to addressability on connected tvs and then we focus on scalability so you've mentioned the fact that we're bringing new advertisers onto uh, onto TV, and these advertisers typically have very small budgets, or at least, you know, very <laughs> important budgets for, for, for them, but different from the scale we are used to on linear TV. And so we have a technology that we slowly make available as a self, uh, self tool for small businesses to plan onto, uh, and that would help us make, you know, everything more, uh, more scalable and embrace all these uh, longer tail, mid tail, uh, advertisers as well. Great, thanks. Let's let's keep on that thread, uh, Verta. There was a lot of um, talks around, you know, digital native advertisers that mm -hmm. are coming to these new formats, right? Because they know th this is what they've had from the other platforms. This is how they buy. You know, uh, Paula just spoke about this. Do you observe the same thing in in, in your market? Um, Absolutely, and actually, they are often uh, the spur for you know greater innovation and, and adaptability. You know, it's a, a, a different form of advertiser with a different set of questions, and we've had to obviously adapt and work towards that. So, we effectively now have um, a data and uh, program a team of data and programmatic specialists, really focusing in two key areas that speak directly, um, I think, to this point. So, the first is around the transactional capability. So, how can we make it easy for uh, people to buy particularly our, our video on demand product from us. You know, all four has 25 million registered users, so we have a very strong um, data set there as well. So, the the pro we have sort of two areas there: either the programmatic guaranteed, which is actually probably speaks more to medium and bigger advertisers, where it's about the long-term planning, traded CPMs, um, you know, kind of obviously you know guaranteed impressions. But we recently just launched a uh, private marketplace, so the UK's first broadcast private marketplace. And that is absolutely sort of auction based, exactly as, as you would expect from the, from the descriptor, for those in the know. Um, but what we're seeing there is that what it's driving in is new money, different advertisers, and actually people that want to come into the market and take advantage of either, you know, perhaps a, a more advantageous cost at a particular moment in, in seasonality, you know, from a seasonal perspective, or actually just being able to put their toe in the water and test out um, the video on demand piece. So we're seeing some really early promising growth there. And importantly, seeing that actually our returns are, are holding up. So our, our CPM delivery is holding up there. The second area that we're really focusing on is the targeting capability. And again, a number of these newer advertisers are really keen to be able to bring their own data to the party and for us to, to work in a way that allows them to see, obviously, the results back to their business. So whether it be through actually first, you know, the data matching pieces or whether it's about buying more bespoke segments, we've had to now, you know, learn, adapt both from digital behaviours but also from the needs and wants of these particular advertisers. Yeah. Thomas, can I just say, it, yeah. 
it is an iteration though, isn't it? Because you know, Sky started this actually with AdSmart. It was one of the biggest reasons that they introduced AdSmart. You know, we're an AdSmart partner, we'll be an AdSmart partner uh, or an addressable linear partner with Channel 4 as well. And then I think the, the, the pandemic just sped that up because actually some of the bigger traditional advertisers were pulling away, right? Mm -hmm. And it made everyone think, you know, we, we need to, this is a great time to encourage new advertisers to TV. So I think that, that has really helped um, kind of speed up that kind of move from it not just being big, expensive, traditional TV advertisers to a much more diverse advertiser set, definitely. Yeah, do you feel, that's a good point, do you feel that the expectations that these buyers have are, you know, different to the traditional set of buyers that you've, you've had in the past, you know, who are more, who are traditionally more sort of brand, brand building advertisers and more, uh, you know, closer to TV are the, so they, are the asks that they come to you or, or their agencies in general, uh, or your direct, um, your direct teams, as in your case, Ritza, do you feel that they have different expectation that you have to sort of walk them through, not just the value proposition of TV, but also what's possible? I think I think I'd just sort of be a bit cautious about saying that they, you know, historically TV's just been about brand building because of course we've worked for many years with all forms of different advertisers, you know, those also who want performance and acquisition yeah. kind of results, you know, TV does both the short and long term piece and that's it's actually probably its unique capability and it's, you know, fantastic for, for doing both pieces. I think the thing that these, I suppose, digitally born businesses bring, describe them like that for a moment, is an expectation of greater flexibility. Whereas obviously the advertisers who have been in market for much longer, yeah. uh, you know, will know sort of the, the conventions of the marketplace have been set and that's how that's operated, you know, for all sorts of good reasons. But the expectation is being able to come in and out more quickly, being able to be more flexible about the kind of audiences that are being bought. So that's where, you know, we've had to do a lot of yeah. work as an industry to adapt. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'll switch gear to a, a, again, if I refer to so some of the conversation we, we spoke about that Gil you know, mentioned it in the previous conversation, uh, the concept or the discussion around sort of, and I'll use quotation mark, air quotation mark, I don't know if you can see Paula, but um, wall gardens. Um, you know, obviously the chart that I put up in the US, you know, huge market, huge ad market, you know, some of these sort of vertical you know, uh, companies are creating their own sort of end-to-end, -end, um, you know, from tech to sales uh, environment for many, everybody to come in. You know, there's lots of conversation, you know, obviously ITV is, is kind of launched Planet V and, and we've heard a lot about that in the last few, uh, few weeks. What's the, you know, what are your views in general about sort of you, the European perspective? And, you know, start with the UK, obviously, uh, and then I'll ask uh, sort of power, but give, you know, we have five minutes left. Give us your, your, your thoughts in, uh, in a little bit. Uh, Katie, I guess I'll, I'll, keep, <laughs> I'll keep this one off. Um, so I think our perspective, of course, well, so the question becomes really, uh, is it important to provide a marketplace that makes it easy to transact and to, to buy video on demand? Uh, the answer clearly has to be yes, and we heard it in the Enders report from Jill and Bobby just earlier, that that's a very clear call from advertisers. But actually what we're thinking about here, if you take a step back, is that means it needs to be a marketplace that is secure, you know, that actually offers a secure transaction basis, that offers, um, you know, protection for the viewers and sort of the data side of, of things, and also that gives the flexibility that advertisers, that I was just alluding to, that advertisers are looking for. Now, a walled garden is one way of doing that, but it isn't the only way of doing that. And of course, this really comes back to a philosophical question of whether or not you are effectively as an organization or as an industry, believers in walled gardens or whether you want to be interoperable and allow for the maximum number of access points into a marketplace. So if you think about, again, a, a pure marketplace, it needs to have liquidity of demand and obviously multiple access points is the way of, is, is, a, is the best way of doing that. But equally also need, we need to consider which kind of money we're targeting, which new monies we're targeting. And going back to what we were just touching on, you know, new advertisers, different advertisers, digitally native advertisers, you know, again, have these different needs and wants, and they already have their own tools in place. So then you have the philosoph philosophical question of, do you then force them to use your tools, or do you allow your marketplace to be open for people to bring their own? This is something that we've got to keep working through. Should we have a unified, easy way of transacting uh, broadcaster video on demand? That's something that we absolutely need to work towards. Um, 
should it have just a single walled garden access point, I have a view it may not be shared by others. So that, that would be my perspective. Fair enough. And it's very much driven by scale, isn't it? You yes. know, we were having this conversation. It, what might be the right answer for one organisation in one market is not ne necessarily the way that it should work for everybody. And as we've said, it's about, it's about choice. It's about, you know, making sure that you're discoverable and available to the most, you know, the most number of people. The right people, obviously, that's absolutely paramount. We need to protect the premium quality of our content and our experience. But we do have to make sure that we're there for everybody that, you know, that wants to buy us. So. Absolutely. And, and, you know, scale, I think that it's, yeah. it's the key. I mean, Paula, let me, when we talk about scale, I, I'm conscious that when we talk about sort of specific broadcaster collaboration, you've had your own share, um, you know, launching EBX a, you know, a few years ago. Um, before I go to EBX, I mean, <clears throat> clearly the idea of, you know, closer collaboration in a in sort of TV marketplace, well, in Italy, you know, that, you know, might be tricky just given the, the type of player they are. I mean, although I'm sure that you've, you've, you've thought about it, but give us a little bit more uh, on EBX, which is, you know, we've seen grow, you know, quite rapidly over the last, last year. Is there anything that you think is a kind of lesson learned here for people building their own marketplace, sort of bring inventory together that, um, you know, you, you could uh, offer advice to this room with? Uh, so yeah, so in terms of, as you mentioned, so in Italy, it's, it's quite difficult, although in the past year, we've done a lot of work thanks to the uh, FCP, which is the Association of Broadcasters Sales Houses, and we have, uh, we've started a path where we are defining the rules of the game, the standards for addressable TVs provided by broadcasters, and the next step would be, you know, how do we make our inventory available programmatically? Uh, so to the point we were talking about before, so we're not really looking at a wallet garden, but we are looking at setting rules of the game that, that create value and not destroying value and are sustainable for broadcasters with all their rules and regulations uh, and for their specificity. So we, are, we, are, we have started doing that um, in a collaborative manner. And when it comes to ABX, I think... Um, it was a, a very exciting journey, uh, and it started on the ground that broadcasters have the same uh, challenges and opportunities I had in all countries, no matter what the technologies are, the standards are. And so we were all going in the same direction and created that layer of a uniform technology, uh, you know, standardizing across country was extremely difficult because we have different markets, different uh, also demands from advertiser in the local markets than the one we have on a pan-regional uh, scale, so that was quite quite challenging. But I think we found a way of simplifying it and you know making out, taking out you know what the best value, which is the quality of the inventory we offer, and make it available across the country, which is uh, which has been deeply appreciated in the past year, as you mentioned. So we've seen amazing growth. Yeah, thanks. We're at time. Um, you know, three sort of words to, to to finish, which every one of you has, has sort of mentioned across. You know, scale, um, standards, uh, which Paula just mentioned. I think that's particularly yeah. paramount. Um, you know, we did touch on on sort of opportunities. Um, we probably could talk about it for for hours, but we're at, we're at time, and I think we've got other other panels. So, I wanted to thank you, Varicha. Thanks, Katie, Paula. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank enjoy you. the rest of your day. We're sorry not to have you here. Um, it's and snowing for, here. Thanks for having Snow. us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank awesome. you. Great.